Hey, let me ask you something. Do you know what this is? It might help if I show it to you from a slightly different angle. If you guessed half inch plastic ball valve, well, congratulations, you are 90% correct. This here, my illustrious electronic friends, is nothing less than a marvel of modern engineering or mastery over the natural world, undisputed dominant. This right here in my hand before your very eyes is the culmination of hundreds of years of human struggle to make something at the lowest possible cost. Now don't confuse low price with bad quality. Not in this case anyway, that's not the point I'm trying to make. Here we're talking about optimizing a product for its manufacturing process. These valves, unless you get a bum one, are one of the most reliable, longest lasting, and maintenance free valves humankind has been able to engineer. All for less than $5. Less than three, I think. Whatever they cost. Now that's retail, mind you. So not very much at all is the point I'm trying to make. What I'd like to do is dig into this fine specimen and see just how they did it. We'll cut it to pieces, both figuratively and literally, and have a look inside. You with me? But first, let's take a quick tour of the outside. Again, this is a half-inch valve. That means it's size for standard half-inch tubing. This valve is for water. You run water in one side, and if the knob is open, water comes out the other side. If we look down in there, hopefully you can see the ball that gives this valve its name. It has a single hole going through it that if you align with the valve body, water can get through. Otherwise, it can't. To throw some technical jargon at you, that'd be referred to as closed. Okay, easy enough, right? Hopefully I haven't lost anyone. But take a close look. This thing is one solid piece. The valve body is. How in the HE double Canadian hockey sticks did they get that ball inside there? And in response to whatever answer you just shouted at the screen, why doesn't water just come leaking out the top? Now, this entire valve is injection molded. And the body, the white part, is made of a plastic polymer called PVC. I know that because it said so on the box it was in at the store. It also says it right there. I don't know if you can read that. Let's talk about injection molding a minute because it's fundamental to how this valve is made and more to the topic of this video, how it reaches its price point. Now, before we dig into this valve, let's have a look at a simpler part, like this one. This is the carrying case slash protective cover from a Fiskars brand Axe and is also injection molded. To state the obvious and at the risk of offending some of you, this part is made, well, using a mold often referred to as a tool. The tool that made this protective cover is much simpler than the tool that made this valve. So we'll take a quick look at this one just to warm up a bit. A simple tools have at least two basic parts, a core and a cavity. When you put those two together, they form the exact negative shape of the part you wanna make. That tool, or the mold is used inside of a press, which at high pressure and temperature injects molten plastic into the empty space, filling it up and creating your part. The tool is cooled a little and then opened back up. The core and the cavity separate and the part is ejected, at which point it closes again, another shot is pushed into the tool and the cycle repeats itself ad infinitum, or until someone steals your idea, does it for cheaper and runs you out of town. So as you might imagine, a lot goes into injection molding. It gets complicated. But usually, and especially for less expensive parts, there are usually some telltale signs of how it was made. First, and I guess most evident on most plastic parts, is that it'll have some amount of draft, meaning there's some angle to all of the sides that were parallel to the direction that the tool opened. The draft is needed so the part can actually come out of the tool. Kind of like making sand castles with those little sand castle buckets, which typically have quite a bit of taper to them. If you tried making a sand castle or a crab or a turtle or whatever, with a bucket without draft, without taper, well, you'd have a terrible time getting the sand out of it in one piece. Same goes with plastic molding tools. If I bring in a square for reference, you can see just how much draft there is. Typically, but not always, the cheaper you want the part, the bigger the draft becomes. It's easier to get out of the tool, the tool lasts longer, etc. If this part had some functional requirement where that wall needed to be exactly square, well, you're talking about a more expensive tool. So we've identified the draft direction of the part. Every vertical wall that you see on this thing is angled up in this direction, off of my bench. That means the tool that made this thing opened up front to back, as opposed to say side to side or top to bottom. Because this is a two piece steel mold, as opposed to say, I don't know, a single piece plaster mold that you'd have to break to get the part out, you'll often see witness lines where those two mold halves met in the press. See, tools aren't perfect. There is some tolerance there. And any mismatch at the surface where they come together will show up in the molded part. Naturally, you tend to see it more in cheaper, less expensive molds or molds that are long past their maintenance schedule. I can actually feel that witness line or parting line all the way around the part. But let me bring you in for a closer look. And that's it right there. 
So one half of the tool made the outside of the part, and the other half made the inside. And where they met, left that witness line, left that parting line. Being a two-piece mold doesn't necessarily mean that it's a simple parting line. Where those two halves of the tool meet doesn't necessarily have to be flat. In fact, it rarely is. Let's take a closer look in this area where they needed to create this little diving board that retains the axe head in this holder. Here you're trying to get steel to match up in a lot of different directions, so the odds of it being right on, you know, are a little bit worse. And you can see the parting line here is more pronounced. In fact, it's even getting some flashing or some plastic oozing out between those two pieces of steel, creating kind of a sharp knife edge. And since we're taking the tour here, this won't be too relevant to the valve, I don't think, but just in case. You can also see where the ejector pins were on this part. See those little circular pads in there? After this part's been injected and the tool opens, the part will stick to one half of the tool halves, kind of like peanut butter in the roof of your mouth. Ejector pins, in this case, or some kind of ejection feature, is built into one half of the tool. So when the mold opens, the part has cooled down, the pins come through the face of that tool and bump the part off. Again, since those ejector pins in this case are a separate piece of steel with some tolerance between it and the mold half they live in, and the fact that they're pushing off on probably a pretty warm part, we see evidence of, you know, where that ejection happened. Also on the back side of these markings, we can see it's recyclable, made out of polypropylene, and that five is the number of times you'll likely be able to use this sheath before you either lose it in the sticks or run over it with your car. And the last thing I'd like to show you is that little thing there. That is the gate, or the vestige of the gate. The gate is the little hole in the steel tool where they push the hot plastic into this mold. That's where they filled this from. Okay, so hopefully now we're all talking the same language. Let's take a closer look at this valve. You might notice there's quite a bit of draft angle going on in opposite directions from the center from where the ball lives. And exactly on center, there's one heck of a witness line. So we can wager the guess that two pieces of steel met there and that the tool opened left to right the way we're looking at it on the screen. Maybe you can see a little bit better there, the witness line moving from top to bottom. This also happens to have a couple of labels on the side. Ed, if you're watching, I think I have your valve. That's quite an aggressive witness line. I mean, that's very pronounced. You may be thinking, and rightfully so, that maybe these were two separate parts that were bonded together after the fact, capturing the valve on the inside. But take a look at the bottom. There's the gate. This thing was molded as one piece. Two pieces of steel closed, met up at this line, and they injected plastic in the bottom. That thing that looks like a mismatch at the top is actually a feature in the valve. It's the stop for full open and full close. It's not on the other side, though it's not a perfect fit up there either. In their defense, though, first, it's not important. Second, the machine that makes these, I wouldn't be surprised if it shot them out like a machine gun. It likely makes thousands of these a day. While we're here, let me show you something cool. Granted, cool is a little relative on this channel. So that's where they squirted the plastic into the mold. It started here, under pressure, and started to slowly fill this cavity up. You can imagine the plastic flowing its way around the steel that was creating the opening for the half-inch pipe that will eventually go in here. Those flow fronts met up here at the top, and where they meet, they create a weld line, right? There's plastic flowing up here, there's air inside of the empty space in the tool that's kind of being burped out, and the two flow fronts of plastic meet somewhere up on the top edges because it's being pushed in from the bottom. Now, I can see that weld line let me see if I can get you a better. In person, it's almost impossible to see. I can't feel it under my fingers. But you could just see it as it sort of like plays in the light. What looks like a dark hairline going down the length of the part. Now, it's not a big deal here because this is PVC. But in some materials, that weld line could be a weak point. The material doesn't have the same properties there than it does, you know, in the rest of the part. Basically, if you were to smack this cylindrical area with a hammer, odds are pretty high that no matter where you hit it, that's where it would crack. Sometimes those can also be problematic from like a cosmetic standpoint. You don't want to make a part and see a big weld line running across the front of it. But again, in this case, I don't think anybody really cares. Although, and this is personal preference, I've bondoed, sanded, primered, and repainted all of my water valves. All right, well, I think we're starting to get somewhere. Not exactly sure where that is, but somewhere. Let's get this thing under the knife and see what makes it tick. Please be warned, this is about to get a little bit graphic and may not be suitable for all audience.
Well, I'm no plastic surgeon, but that went a lot better than I expected. Patient died, but the operation was a success. That ball and two seals that I see so far are in there pretty cozy. I haven't taken the handle off yet. I still want to be able to actuate this little ball valve here. So I haven't been able to come up with any good, overly dramatic way of telling you this without infringing copyright law. So I'm just going to lay it on you. The ball in this ball valve, along with those seals, were assembled inside the mold. Let that just sink in a minute. Assembled inside the mold. Just saying that out loud is giving me goosebumps. Now this next part is speculation because I wasn't inside of the mold when this happened, but I'm pretty sure the ball and seals were assembled onto a mandrel in the injection molding tool. Probably by a robot and likely on a better fitting mandrel than I'm currently demonstrating. The mold then closed around the ball, seals, and mandrel, just like we saw earlier, kind of coming in along the axis of this valve, and the PVC was injected to create the valve body. It created the valve body around the parts and the geometry that was inside of the mold. Genius. I hope I'll be able to show this to you. It's quite subtle. When they injected the PVC in this case, where that molten plastic touched polished tool steel, like the mandrel that went through this to keep it all together, you may be able to see that the surfaces are very glossy. They're very bright. But where the ball and the seals are, it picked up that surface finish from those parts, more of like a matte, dull finish. If you look close, the molten PVC also picked up an imprint of the gate that was on the ball. So this ball was made in its own tool ahead of time. It was injected just like we saw before through a gate. Here's the vestige of that gate. It's not totally smooth and the molten plastic picked that up when it was formed around it. There are also some wrinkles or halos around this because again this is where the PVC was injected. In fact I'm willing to bet, well let me get some calipers. What I'm going to do is measure the thickness of the plastic on both sides above and below this valve right here in this area. That's 175 and 20, about 190. It's about the same thing, 190 thou. Let's check the same spot on the bottom half. That's 210, 210 thou. If I can get this back together. So here's what I think happened. We said the parts on the inside are on a mandrel, sort of floating in space. Steel closes around it in the form of this valve body, and plastic is injected in through the bottom. That plastic is coming in at a significant pressure. When that pressure hit these parts on that sort of floating mandrel, it pushed it all up. It pushed the mandrel up, pushed everything away from that injection point, which resulted in a thinner top, just measured 190 thou, and a thicker bottom. 210 thou. So that whole mandrel valve and seal assembly moved up about 20 thou, half a millimeter. Again, it doesn't matter in this case because it's all sort of molded around all of the critical functioning parts, but that's pretty neat to see. Now, I can't imagine this sort of stuff is easy to figure out, but in a way, it's sort of the opposite of overmolding. I think we're all familiar with these rubber grips they put on everything these days. This would have been done in two steps, just like the ball valve. They made this red, rigid plastic part, put it in another tool that had just the voids for this overmolded part, and squirted the rubber in. Now, in this case, the rubber is selected so it's chemically compatible with sort of whatever base resin this is. When it goes in there hot, it sticks to this plastic and it's hopefully never going to come off again. In the case of the valve, it's just the opposite. The materials here were selected so they were very incompatible. Now, I don't know what this ball is made out of. We could probably take some educated guesses. But if this PVC would have bonded chemically with whatever material that is, well, you wouldn't be in the valve business for very long. Let's put it that way. But that's not all. When I actuate this valve, can you see those seals being sort of pushed apart? The shape of that ball is such that when you close the valve, it would be compressing those seals. Effectively, it's making that seal a little more bulletproof. When this valve is open, I mean, I'm sure there's some amount of compression from the way this thing was molded to keep that from letting too much water pass. But in this case, if it leaked, it's not really a big deal, right? You want water to get out the other side. You don't want water to come out the top the stem, but we'll look at that in a minute. But when it's closed, it kind of cams its way around, compressing those seals even further, ensuring that you don't get any water out the other side when the valve is closed. Genius. I wasn't expecting that. Okay, so I guess these things aren't as maintenance-free as I thought. I mean, I've never had one of these things open, but you can bet if they give you a screw and an O-ring, there was either no other way to seal the top of this valve stem, 
or sooner or later this is going to leak out the top and you need access to change that seal. The screw and the o-ring are probably 50% of the cost of this whole thing. There's a little cap at the top, hides the screw. The screw pushes the handle down against the o-ring, down against the valve body, and creates a seal so water can't get up around this valve stem. Frankly, I was expecting to find another one of these style of seals here at the top, but instead there's that o-ring that lived right there. I mean, just look at how much trouble was involved in minimizing the amount of time and material that went into building something like this. The insight in material properties and injection molding tech that were required to get a machine to spit out an almost complete part. Effectively a functioning valve, one that's extremely good at its job, mind you, almost fully assembled right off the presses. Genius. Okay, that was a little different than what we usually do, but if you stuck around for that whole thing, thanks for watching.